Hi, my name is Andy Harris. I'm the author of a number of books and courses on game and web development. And today I want to show you how to build an interesting game in Blender from scratch. So from zero, we'll be able to build this little Space Invaders game. Let me get it running here. And, um, all right, play. So the game is running. I can control the little triangle guy with the A and D keys. And I can fire... And I have the aliens coming down, and that's pretty fun. So we'll run it again. You can see I can control it. There's limits to how far my character can go. I get cool little sound effects, and the monsters come down. Now, as you can tell, I've put very close to zero effort into the modeling of this game. And the whole idea is to focus on the aspects you may not be familiar with. How do we use Blender as a full-blown game engine? And uh, so we're going we're gonna to really focus on that. We're going to learn. I'm not expecting you to know a ton about Blender. Um, you should be familiar with the basic interface. I'm also not expecting you to know a lot about using the game engine or even Python programming. But if you have these things, that'll be a bonus. And of course, I will show you enough of Python that you can actually do some interesting things. So let's have some fun with this. This is the game we're going to build. Can you believe it? I'm going to kill it. All right all brand new. We'll start from the beginning. So here's your standard Blender file. Now I'm going to recommend that as you're watching this video, you have things running on your own. You try it on your own. I'm using Blender 2.7.2 right now. Um, an earlier version may not have exactly the same features. A lot of the things I'm doing are pretty standard. So there's our, our basic screen. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create our entities. We're going to create the elements. Uh, that box we're looking at, that's our enemy. I know it doesn't look like an enemy, we'll make it more sinister looking. First thing to do is to get it in a top-down view, use the 7 on the numeric keypad to do that. That's our gameplay view, we're going to be looking from the top down. Um, that's our enemy, how do we know? Because it's called the enemy, or it will be soon. We come over here to the Edit Objects property and change its name to Enemy. Now as a Blender user, you may not have been naming things, but today you're a programmer, and programmers name things all the time. It's just going to be central to our life. Um, that perspective view is a little bit distracting now, so I'm going to hit the 5 key on the numeric keypad to turn that off. All right, so there's the enemy. Now, it's not looking very sinister, so let's change its materials. There's the material tab. I'm going to change it to be a menacing red color. There you go. And another thing that I'm going to do as a programmer is I will change material names. So I'm going to call that enemy mat. That turns out to be useful later when we're doing collision detection. So I tend to name every object and every material to make it easier to figure out what's going on as the game gets more uh, complex. All right, now I'm going to click down here to create a new place. And I'm going to add, Shift A to add, the simplest possible um, player element, and that'll be a comb. Three to get a side view, R to rotate. And now I'm going to turn him sideways there. In different kinds of games, I might be a little more concerned, but for now I'm going to go very simple. I'm keeping the modeling as simple as possible so we can focus on the other aspects. Of course, we can do modeling and animation as well, but they're sort of side effects. It happens I'm in the materials editor right now, and the cone does not have a default material. Let's give it one so we can color it. We want a happy green color for our player. And I'm going to name this material player mat. While I'm at it, I'm also going to name the player. Really, really helpful to be naming things. One more thing I'm going to do here. This player is going to need weaponry because, you know, it's an arcade game. Um, what self-respecting arcade game doesn't have weapons? So I'm going to come right here. And I'm going to add an empty. Empty is really, really useful because an empty allows me to have uh, a coordinate system uh, that isn't necessarily connected to an object. Okay, so we're going to take this thing, we're going to call it the gun. And we're going, now it's selected, and I also will shift and select the player. So the gun is always going to be attached to the apex of the player, the control P allows you to parent objects. So now let's take a look at this thing as I move the player, the gun moves along with it. That'll be useful as we move it through through programming. Okay, that's pretty nice. Let's take a look from the top view, zoom out a little bit so we can see what's happening. 
Um, we're not far. We're not far at all. There's a couple of other elements that we'll need. One object we'll need, of course, is a bullet. Um, and the way that we do bullets in gaming is a little interesting. We're going to make it in another plane, and we're going to summon it when we need it. And I'll show you how that works. So the layering system in Blender is these little boxes down here. I click on that box, and um, oh, everything's gone. If you use the uh, number keys at the top of your keyboard, the same thing will happen, but I've disabled that because I'm on a Mac today. Um, so I'm in layer two, where there's nothing yet. Now be sure that you place your cursor in the center. Check and make sure that you're truly in the center on all axes. Okay, good. Uh, because uh, we'll have weird offset issues if we don't make our bullet in the center of its other scene. So now I'm going to shift A, create a mesh. I'm going to go with a nice icosphere because it's not too many vertices. I don't want this to be... Um, it's going to be small, and so I don't want to waste a lot of vertices because there's going to be several of them on the screen. Um, it looks kind of ragged, so we'll set the shading to smooth. The other thing we're going to do is make this small. Now, the easiest way to precisely control things like size is with the numeric input, and on a 3D thing brings you the numeric input. And we'll come over here and change the scale to 0.3. Point three, point three. That's the easiest way to go. You look at that, that's a nice shape. Now another thing we're going to be doing with this thing is of course we'll name it bullet. We'll give it a material. We'll make yellow bullets. Nothing like happy bullets. Okay, so nice yellow bullets and we'll name the material as well. If you don't know what to name, name everything. In this case, we will definitely be naming the bullet material and the bullet because it will be interacting with stuff a lot. All right, now we want the bullet to actually move around using the physics engine. And so we'll need to actually activate it as a physics object. Most of the other objects we'll be controlling directly through code or user input. But the bullet um, is going to react a little bit to physics. And so what we'll need to do is enable the physics. Now when you hit this physics tool, you'll see all these neat things. None of them are what we want. See, there's actually two different variants of physics in Blender. One is for creating things for the rendering, like for movies. That's not what we're looking for here. We want the gaming physics engine, which is actually quite a powerful physics engine. So make sure you change the overall renderer from Blender Render, the default, to Blender Game. And you will see these buttons change. So now it's the physics that we need for the gaming engine. We're going to set the physics type to dynamic. There are many other types, but dynamic is simple. Um, this collision circle is large, but I'm happy with that. That's going to make the game a little more uh, easy. So I'm going to leave all of the other defaults alone, and we think we should be okay. Now let's go back to the main screen, and we'll start actually doing something dynamic. So our game is already pretty close. Um, we've got all the main elements in place, so we can actually try to make it do something. All right, now to do something, we'll switch over from the default view to the game logic view. Now, this is a view designed to help us do game development, and it's got some wonderful features. Here is an outline of all of the various objects in our scene. Here's the scene itself. Here's a place to write some code. Ooh, programming, we're awesome. Um, this is going to be a place that, for us to add some sensors and controllers and actuators. They're really useful tools for making Python or Blender do interesting stuff. And here's the properties window. We'll be adding a property soon, but let's wait until we need it. Now I'm going to select the gun first. And when I have the gun activated, now what I want to do is I want to tell it that something, it should respond to some sort of event. The sensors are all about events that we can listen to. Let's go with the easiest one to understand. That is the keyboard event. Now the keyboard actuator says, okay, tell me about the event you're listening for. I'm listening for a key. I can press which key. Let's have it fire the gun on a space bar. All right, beautiful. Now the actuators say what to do. And so on the actuator, I'm going to add an actuator, and I'm going to add an edit object actuator. We can just drag a string between the two, and what will happen is it will add an AND controller. Don't worry about that for now. So what this says is when the space bar gets pressed, I want you to 
edit an object. In this case, it says add an object. Of course, let's tell it which object. Bullet. Aren't you glad we named these? If we hadn't named these, you'd have to remember, oh yeah, that, what, which one is the bullet? So we're going to add a bullet. All right, let's try it. Now to try something out, you have to have your mouse over the 3D window and hit the P key for play. It'll change a little bit. And now I hit, well, it's doing something. Now you can't exactly tell what it's doing. I'm gonna to switch to a side view and now you'll be able to see what it's doing. We'll play it again. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's making bullets, but those are kind of sad bullets because the bullet is a dynamic physics object. It is falling. And so we create it and it falls down, but that's not really what we want. Escape to get out of there. One of the great things we can do when we add an object is give it an initial linear velocity. That means when you show up, I want you to already be moving. And so we're going to give it a large linear velocity of 30 units per, per frame. And so it's going to be moving in its positive Y that's along the green axis at 30 units. So, you know, how do I know? Well, I've tried. That's pretty fast. That should be pretty close. Um, I'm going to hit the L for local, meaning if we rotate this guy, I want it to be around its local Y. Don't panic. It won't make a difference in this game. All right. Now let's try and see what it does. Okay, here we go. Oh, yes. Yay. It's working. Now it looks a little silly, so it just stops when it hits the block and kind of just sits there and then falls. Okay, a couple things we'll want to do. One thing is that I was lucky. Sometimes it'll droop underneath the ball. So we may want to have some sort of a plane to catch it. Does that make sense? Yeah, we do. Um, so here's what we'll do there. Let's escape out of this. Go back to a top view. And this is somewhere near the center of the screen. Shift A, mesh plane. S24, so scale it to be 24 units square. That just seems about right to me. And if you want, we can add a material to that. Let's just go ahead and add something fun to that so that it looks nice and, and, and black when we're playing it. So I'm going to go back to default. It's easier to get at things. Um, we'll add a new material to the plane. We'll make it black. And uh, to keep it, if we play it right now, it'll still look kind of, oh, that actually looks pretty good. Let's leave it like that. Okay, sometimes I play with the specularity to get it a deeper black, but I like that. Now, I didn't name this object because I know I'm not going to refer to it in code. Um, let's play again and see how the bullet looks against it. That's pretty good. I'm a little concerned that the ball is going underneath it. So let's look on the side. Oh, yeah, here's what we're going to do. Drop that plane down a little bit on the side. All right, now we'll play from the side and see. Okay, cool. Now it's sitting there at the plane. Because the plane is static, um, the ball will just rest on it. Okay, this is pretty good. You liking this? Okay. Now what we want to have happen is we want to detect a collision. So when the um, ball hits the enemy, the enemy and the ball will both disappear. Okay, we can do that with plain old logic. So let's take a look at this. There is the box. So I select the box. Go back to logic view. And now we'll look at a different kind of sensor. So on the box, we're going to say collision. So I'm detecting a collision. Now what's neat is that we can detect a collision against an element that contains a certain material. And that's why I had you name the material. So we'll switch this from... Uh, property mode to material mode, just because the materials are a little easier to work with, I think. And we're going to change the material on the list, so bullet mat. That's why I had you name that. So when I collide with any object containing the bullet mat material, here's what I want to do. And of course, here's what we want to do. We'll add an actuator, edit object. And this time, rather than adding an object, we're going to end an object. Now you can add any object you want, but you can only end yourself. I guess that's sort of, I guess, all right, fine. So it's going to commit glorious, glorious seppuku when it gets hit by anything containing the bullet material. So let's try that and see what happens. Play. Yes. Now the bullet's just sort of sitting there, so we should do the same thing to the bullet. And we will come back over to the bullet and select it. And we'll add... A collision sensor to the bullet. The bullet says, hey, I'm looking for enemy mat. 
And when I hit something with enemy mat, then I want to shuffle off this mortal coil. That was Shakespeare, world cultural around here. All right, so there we go. So now when I get back and play this guy again, let's zoom in. The ball and the enemy both disappear. Oh, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Yes, we're very close. Okay, well now we want to make the um, player move. And we can do that relatively simple with the uh, with similar kinds of controls. Uh, we can also do it with scripts, but I'm going to show you the easy way first. So we'll add a sensor. This time we'll add a keyboard sensor to the player. And um, I'm going to use A and D. The A key for going left, the D key, kind of the WASD thing we're used to as gamers. Um, so I'll hit the A key, and then I will add called a motion actuator. Motion actuator looks very simple but it's actually kind of deep um, and it changes depending on your object type. But we can change its location in X, Y, or Z and we can change its rotation around X, Y, or Z. Okay, well let's see. When I hit the A key I want its delta X to change a little bit. I want it to um, go to the left. So I'm going to modify X by let's say minus 0.3. And we'll see how that works. Ready? We hit the play and now when I hit the A key it moves to the left. Now it moves to the left forever. We can fix that but I'm not going to worry about it right now. Okay, let's go the other direction. If you want to, you can minimize things to make it a little cleaner. All right, so we'll make it a little cleaner here. We'll add another motion actuator. Now this time, if we use the D key, there's the D, then I want to change its X by a positive 0.3. All right, so let's try it. Cool, and let's see if the firing is still integrated. Cool. So now I have a nice, really kind of fun control. And I have a box. Now, of course, we need the enemies to move, or this is not a very interesting game. Now, we could use these kinds of controllers um, to move the box, but it turns out that gets very messy very quickly. And so, uh, uh, trying to get it to, you know, I want it to move backwards and forwards, and every time it hits an edge, I want it to move down a little bit, and then I want a bunch of these to do that, right? Well, that's the sort of stuff that we're starting to outgrow these logic bricks. Uh, but don't worry, uh, programming in Python is actually quite easy. Even if you've never programmed before, you'll probably follow what's going on. So let me show you how we can actually write a little Python script to make the enemies act the way we want. So you select the enemy, and now we come over to this scripting window, and under Templates, Python, there's a game logic simple, and that's a good one to start with because pretty much every Python game logic I've ever done starts out the same way. Now, much of this stuff is kind of generic, and we won't actually use all of this. So I'm going to take this whole piece between sense and before main and just take it all out. We are going to use the top part. Let me explain what's happening. Import BGE, that imports the Blender game engine, so we'll have access to the code for controlling the game through code. Def main says, hey, this is my main function. Yo, you're my main function. This is the one that we're going to do. Now, cont gets bge.logic.getCurrentController. What that means is, um, well, let me show you how I'm going to hook it up. That'll make you more sense. I'm going to add a new sensor called an always sensor. Now, the always sensor, you click this little guy, and that means on every frame, could be 60 frames per second, it's going to send a little pulse. It's going to activate whatever I tell it to do. So this is going to happen very, very frequently. Before I was looking for a particular event. Now I'm going to send a pulse off all the time. And my code is going to figure out what happens. All right, fine. Now I'm going to add a controller. Now this time, rather than the standard AND controller, I'm going to add a Python controller. Now the Python controller is interesting because it allows me to put Python code in place. All right, now... Got that? I'm going to change the name of my script to move enemy. 
and we can see what's going on. So cont gets bge.logic.get current controller. That's a little bit wordy, but what it really means is, hey, cont is a variable that reflects this controller right here. That's mainly interesting because it allows us to get at something else. I'm going to change this name from own to enemy. So enemy is a new variable containing cont's owner, which is this box. Most of the time, almost every time I've ever done anything in the Blender game engine, I'm going to start with something like this. Really, I want to know what object controls this script. Um, so I'm going to create a new object called enemy. Now let's see what we can do with that. Turns out there's something interesting. I'm going to type some code and see if you can figure out what it means. Enemy.position.x plus equal 0.2. Now plus equal means add to add this value to itself. Okay, so 0.2, enemy.position.x. I'm going to play it and see if you can figure out what it does. Uh, nothing. And here's why. I didn't tell it what script I want to use. Move enemy. All right, let's try it again. Oh, it moves. That was exciting. Here, let's do it again. Here we go. It moves by itself. That's pretty cool. Now, I could have done that with logic bricks, but here's the part I can't. When it hits the edge, I want it to back up. I want it to go the other direction, and that's not quite so simple. Now, here's the way I'm going to get there. I really need what's called a variable. So it shouldn't be 0.2. It should be a variable whose value can change. Uh, and here's how we're going to do that. We're going to, while well, this is selected, we're going to add what's called a game property. And a property allows us to connect a variable to an object. I'm going to call my property dx, delta x, difference in x. It's just mathy and sciency, but that's what we use. It means I'm going to, how much is x going to change every frame? I'm going to leave it as a float, which means it can have decimal parts. And I'm going to set that to 0.2. If you remember, the player moves at 0.3, I'm going to make the enemy slightly slower than the player. Because I love the player. It's my friend. It's me. Alright, so we'll have the enemies move a little bit slower than the player will. Now, I can change this. Rather than saying 0.2, I can use this variable. So I can say enemy, and this is kind of weird syntax, but once you get used to it, it's okay. Square braces quotes. That means look up the property called dx belonging to enemy and add that amount to the enemy's position. X. Okay, this should work the same way. Let's see if it does. Oh, yay. Now, here's the great thing about having it in a variable is that I can now change it. So, I'm going to move up a little bit. I'm going to say if enemy.position.x is larger than 20. Now I could say I could set enemy dx to a negative value or I could just multiply it by negative 1 which will just invert the value. And that's what I'll do. Enemy dx times equal minus 1. That means if it was positive, which it will be in this case, make it negative. Okay, now I'm going to do something similar if enemy dot position dot x is less than minus 20. Do the same thing. Enemy dx times equal negative 1. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're looking for boundaries. So if the enemy's position is larger than 20, that's going to be over here somewhere, then invert dx. So now it'll add a minus 0.2 for a while. Eventually, it'll get less than minus 20. Invert dx again, and it'll go positive. Okay, let's just get this working. See how it goes. All right, so come on over here. Play. Come on, come on. Oh, yes, it backed up. Okay, let's see if it goes the other way. Very nice. Very nice. Now, it's let's back it up a skosh so we can see better what's happening. Keep it on the screen. Good. Now, it's getting a little dark on the edges, which maybe we'll want, maybe not. Here's what I'll do. Um, I'm going to look at a side view. Change the lighting scheme. I could add more lights, or I can simply change this light 
so that it's a different kind of light. I'm going to change it to a sun, and that may make it too bright. Let's see. Yeah. Okay, that brightens things up, but I really don't want the background to be that bright, so we'll modify the background just a little bit. Um, the background material, or the... Uh, we'll change the specular intensity to very not intense. There, that keeps it nice and black. Specularity is about reflection of light. So when I reduce the intensity of the specular reflection, what I'm really doing is saying, hey, don't reflect light off of this. This is something that absorbs light. Okay, that's working. Are you excited? I'm excited. Okay, let's make it move downwards as well. You can probably figure out how that's going to work. NME.position.y plus equals 3. That's going to move it down um, a little more than its own, uh, its own height. We'll do the same thing on the other direction. Okay, that's looking pretty good. So let's see if now it moves down when it hits either border. Okay, make sure you move your cursor over this guy before you hit P, otherwise you end up typing P in your code. That's very confusing. Oh, I went up. <laughs> the reason I went up, oh, I do this every time, is that in many programming languages, I increases downwards. Blender is more like traditional math, where I increases upwards. So I always get it wrong the first time. No big deal. All right, there, it's going down. Let's see if it goes down this time. Beautiful, and I can shoot it. Oh, wait, we need the pew, pew, pew noises, don't we? We can do that next. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Yes, it's very cool. Okay, let's do one more thing. Let's add those fun pew, pew, pew noises. It turns out that's pretty easy to do. Now we have to look back at our code and see um, where all this is. Now I'm going to come back to the gun because the gun is where we were reading the space bar. Now, in addition to creating an object, I'll do another actuator called a sound actuator. Let's go find that thing. There it is. And the sound actuator allows me to open up a wave file or something. Here, I've got a, got a good one. And we'll say play and that plays the sound until it finishes. And now here's where the and comes in. I can either use it for input or for output. I can say do both of these things when the space gets pressed. So not only will I create the bullet, I'll also play the pew sound. So let's try it. Oh, I missed. Yay! I could do another sound effect when the box gets killed or whatever, but we're getting very close to our game, aren't we? Yeah, we are. A couple more steps. The, the next thing to do is to make more boxes. Now, you don't do that until you're basically pretty happy with one. Uh, and it turns out there's a couple of ways to do this, but the easiest, I think, is with the keyboard. Shift-D for duplicate, then immediately GX3 enter. That means move, G means grab or move, um, X means along the X, X axis, three units. So we'll do that again. Shift D, G, X, three, enter. Shift D, G, X, three, enter. It's the dance of the duplicators. Shift D, G, X, three, enter. What do you want, one more? X3, enter. Okay, I like that. Now, because I duplicated after I did everything, everything gets duplicated. The material, the behavior, everything. So now we'll hit the play button and they should all move according to it. They should all die on command. Woohoo! That is your basic Space Invaders Centipede style game. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? Is there more? Of course there is. We could add scoring. We could add the ability to animate all of these creatures so that they look like they're wiggling. Of course, we could make them more interesting than just triangles and boxes. Um, but the basic part of making the actual game happen, well, there you go. Um, come back and uh, maybe we can take it a little bit farther. I can show you how to have an end of game condition or how to add new um, levels, um, what to do when the you know monsters finally get to the bottom, but you can probably figure that out yourself. 
All right. Have a great time. I'll see you later.